Atlas will bring about a new galactic order. I like if you will. I'm sorry, are we just letting in all Hitlers now? Each and every man under my command owes me 100 Nazi scalps. And I want my scalps. The one who sent me was Nazi. I heard George Lucas. Who else heard George Lucas? What radicalized you? If you've been asked that question, it was just as likely about what movie, show, book, or game radicalized you, as much as it was a question about which of your childhood to young adult encounters with systemic violence stole a part of your childhood and gave you that little nugget of anti-government rage to foster into a burning fire that changes you as a person and renders you fundamentally broken and unable to connect with others properly. Just me? Eh, whatever. The point is, that the media we consume often does instill core values in us that we don't forget. A lot of gym bros will gladly recite the vaguely fascistic Attack on Titan quotes that made them hit a new PR, or recall the fight between Gar and Rock Lee as inspiration. And some aspects of fictional worlds can be found so profound by fans that they literally spawn semi-religious, although intentionally mimetic, adherence to the philosophical ideas expressed by the media. I can personally attest to this. I learned a lot of positive socialization, empathy, and stuff from media I was exposed to as a kid and as a teen, and I would definitely credit books and shows I watched as a kid with anti-fascist themes like Avatar and The Less Good Avatar as why I'm anti-fascist and anti-colonial now. A lot of people will discuss stuff like BoJack Horseman and the impact it had on their mental health and how it helped them improve or grow. Of course, this still holds up in the much less fun domain of, like, actual politics, and the genre of literary entertainment and film entertainment have both literally always been political. Stories are often deliberately constructed to inspire specific modes of political action, and that doesn't just apply to actual fiction. As we've tragically been forced to learn for the umpteenth time, it heavily applies to the news, especially in our own spectacle culture where everything is inherently somewhat fictional. And that says nothing of how popular media often evokes the aesthetics of radicalism without any of the actual ideology being present, or even blatantly reformist or straight-up fascistic messaging being shown instead. But I personally want to dig more deeply into this topic because a lot of people can claim whatever about the radical politics of whatever show they like, but I want to ask the question, how much does it really matter? Like how much value in our current climate do these different stories have? How much value does the standing interpretation of these stories have? How actually radical are these stories? And where do they fall or slip up in their messaging? Where are they just blatant propaganda? I think sometimes these debates get a little ridiculous and personal to some people, and it's hard to have this conversation, so I want to preface this by saying that if I say something you don't like about something you like, you're welcome to comment why you think I'm wrong, but please be polite. In other words, this is an excuse for me to rant about things I like. I hope you enjoy this video. My name is Anansi, and let me tell you a story. It shouldn't come as a surprise to any of you in the American audience, but Hollywood low-key loves anti-fascism. No, not like actual real-life anti-fascism, but like anti-fascism in that the villain of this movie is Nazis because why not? and little other commentary being made. Sure, the Nazis, as villains, may be selfish or cruel or whatever, but oftentimes there's not really a statement being made about the nature of fascism itself, but just the nature of, like, general villainy. Evoking the aesthetics of fascism just gives your villain a little extra oomph. Pizzazz. Hollywood wasn't, and still isn't always, friendly to the concept of anti-fascism, though. In the years leading up to World War II, Hollywood executives often worked closely with Nazi top brass to ensure the films they were releasing were in line with Nazi preferences in terms of portrayal of Germans and Nazis and how it would affect the German people. Ideologically, Hollywood executives were willing to put up with this scrutiny because they wanted access to German film markets as American films did pretty well there. As a result, many early anti-fascist films were either made outside of major studios or had content edited down to be more palatable to a German audience. This wasn't necessarily because the executives themselves were Nazis, but they wanted the money so they were willing to work with Nazis. As Hitler, Mussolini, Franco, and Tojo rose to power in the early and mid-1930s, the heads of the major US studios, all Jewish except for Zanuck at Fox, were determined not to stick their necks out. 
They had their reasons. They were allergic to controversy and were admonished to avoid it by the industry's new self-censoring production code administration. They were attuned to US public opinion's prevailing interwar isolationism and the US's official policy of neutrality. They were sensitive to a healthy strand of American anti-Semitism that might label them globalist warmongers or communists for any perceived interventionism. And they feared offending foreign governments and or audiences. A sound business calculation given that foreign markets accounted for a full 40% of Hollywood's pre-war revenues. Thus, the moguls resisted pressure from their own left-leaning film artists, especially its screenwriters and directors, whose ranks grew with European, often Jewish, emigres fluing Nazism. This general trend started to change around the mid-1930s, with Warner Bros being one of the first major studios to push back publicly against fascism, refusing to fire Jewish employees at Nazi direction, and closing its offices in Germany in 1934. On top of that, they produced one of the first pieces of anti-fascist propaganda to come out of Hollywood in the Looney Tunes short Bosco's Picture Show, and later with the film Black Legion. It was 1936, however, when a coalition of American and immigrant Jewish leftists, filmmakers, actors, and studio heads, along with members of the American Communist Party and the American Popular Front, formed the Hollywood Anti-Nazi League. One of their major actions was basically driving Lenny Riefenstahl from Hollywood using the oldest anti-fascist trick in the book, doxing the fuck out of her, and letting the communities know that these Nazis aren't welcome. It always works. Nazis coming to your area? Let the whole hood know where they're gonna be, and watch them handle it on their own. Lenny later stated in an interview that the only person in Hollywood who would see her was, get this, Walt Disney himself. The League staged protests, distributed anti-Nazi pamphlets, and advocated for films that were anti-fascist in nature. The fact that CPUSA members were not aside, the organization was doomed to be labeled communist and come under investigation by the House of Un-American Activities Committee. You know, that thing I like to bring up when right-wingers that I debate accuse the left of thought control. The HANL, as an organization, ceased all anti-Nazi actions in 1939 with the signing of the molotov ribbons Rob Pact. They then changed their name to the American Peace Movement and became staunchly anti-war in probably one of the only time periods where it was really not cool to be anti-war. But despite this, Hollywood itself continued to make anti-fascist films. Two particular films, Confessions of a Nazi Spy and Charlie Chaplin's The Great Dictator, were especially prominent. Although the former was received by Nazis in the same way American History X was, in that they loved it because it made them look scary as fuck to people. As the war continued on though, more and more movies, TV, and cartoons were created that were anti-fascist and patriotic in nature, encouraging people to support the war effort and fight the Nazis. Don't look at the anti-Japanese propaganda though, it's all really racist. One medium where anti-fascism really took off and became a consistent theme was comic books. 1941 saw the debut of Captain America, an overtly pro-American and anti-fascist character. And even earlier, we saw Superman, a figure created by two Jewish Americans whose families had fled anti-Semitic violence. Much of the anti-fascist media that was coming out at this point had the direct hand of the government in it, as they were trying to hype people up to join a second grinding, horrifically violent campaign in Eastern Europe, this time with the entire South Pacific as DLC. So while the Russians were playing Wolfenstein, the French playing Assassin's Creed, and the Americans doing One Piece in real life but way less cool, Americans' entire media climate churned out patriotic anti-fascism. And when the war ended, the train didn't stop. Not out of a genuine anti-fascism a lot of the time, but because socially speaking, fascistic imagery became shorthand for absolute evil. So it was easy as like writing shorthand to make villains that people could hate by just making them Nazis. Something similar happened with communism, almost to the same degree, but the consistent use of Nazi imagery in popular mediums such as comic books and films, even as some of the more political themes were at times stripped away or bastardized, did still create a sort of cultural anti-fascist attitude that lasts to this day. The wartime anti-fascism within America's media climate, despite usually coming from a nationalistic, albeit progressive-ish, except the anti-Japanese propaganda, yeah, was still an undeniable need and good. It instilled those values in a way that still lasts to this day. At the same time, I wouldn't credit it for being a major factor in the US getting directly involved in the war. Pearl Harbor made that basically inevitable. And by that point, most people who were pushing for non-inventionism from the US were pretty clearly pro-Nazi and pro-German. In fact, anti-war activism in that time was almost exclusively the domain of fascists, which is why the Hanel suddenly making a heel turn and becoming anti-war in 1939 is shocking, to say the least. With that little bit of history out of the way though, we can move on to more relevant things.
As discussed in the last chapter, the World War II era military propaganda and post-war reification of the Nazis as a proverbial big bad on screen led to a deeply run cultural anti-fascist patriotism. Thus, well past the era where it was necessary as propaganda, Nazis remained villains until it got to a point where anti-Nazi films weren't saying much about anti-fascism, more than relying on the aesthetic of a cultural enemy to be an immediate shorthand for someone being evil or a villain. Films like The Lion King or Inglorious Bastards, for example, could often use the aesthetics of fascism for villains, but weren't necessarily saying anything profound about fascism itself. At the risk of making this video a bit meandering for this section, I'd like to rant a bit about some of my favorite and least favorite examples of anti-fascism media. There is a point to this, but this entire section is a kind of establishing a basis for a later point to be made. I think the new DCEU show, Peacemaker, is an example of what I was talking about a moment ago. The show is aware of fascism and there are jokes and moments that play to modern fascism and social issues, but they're mostly just jokes and references. It doesn't feel like there's a lot being said about fascism and fascists themselves. I mean, they're trying, but the fascists in the show are these, like, hillbilly southern kkk white dude hicks live in trailer parks the abuse that chris suffers as a child at the hands of his father facto leader of this community of nazis is posited as the reason why he struggles with his own bigotry now which is the major source of tension with him and his team i think the most positive take the show has on fascism is the importance of empathy kindness and patience and how the empathy that exists within the team's group dynamic and from Autobio specifically, is capable of de-radicalizing and changing people like Chris. But at the same time, I think this all kind of rings a little hollow, because this is a team of CIA super cops, one of whom is an admitted child murderer. His catchphrase is literally, I value peace and I don't care how many men, women, or children I have to kill to get it. The anti-fascist messaging being given can sometimes be overshadowed by the over-the-top actions and words of the characters, even when those actions are condemned. On top of that, the show's focus on the social dynamics of fascism are at the expense of any analysis of the systemic dynamics of fascism. Relying on depicting them as a gang of southern hick bullies wearing KKK hoods lets us ignore some of the fascistic elements of the main cast and perpetuates an image of fascism that forgets how they aren't always groups of sunburned Texans slurring the phrase the South will rise again, but can be people much more well-dressed and subtle than that. In fact, what many people don't know is that the KKK was primarily a wealthy white institution, which isn't to say regular working class white folks didn't join, but judges, senators, cops, religious leaders, landowners, the wealthy, they actually made up its leadership and made it happen. Even the moments that revealed the fascistic thinking by people within the government don't really get into the meat of it. Interesting and compelling storytelling is taking place, and the character dynamics created by these relations are interesting, but little else is being said. I think a story on the opposite end of this is The Hunchback of Notre Dame. Despite having some issues with comedic timing and tone, The Hunchback of Notre Dame is easily one of my favorite Disney films of all time, and despite it not being about fascism, capital F, in fact the story takes place before fascism is even invented, the relations present both socially and systemically within the world are proto-fascistic and pulling from that same analysis. Claude Frollo is the archetypical fascist, deeply racist to a genocidal degree, deeply misogynistic, authoritarian, and fanatical. Frollo is also a deeply abusive parent and incredibly ableist. He keeps Quasimodo locked away because the world would be mean to him, although the real reason is because he doesn't want to be seen in public raising a disabled Romani child. I think the most telling moment of this is his song to Quasimodo that preludes the song out there, and the alphabet he has Quasimodo reciting. These both serve as indoctrination tools with easily repeatable call and response style phrases for Quasi to speak that reinforce that he is ugly, he is unwanted, and undeserving of freedom and incapable of handling it slash caring for himself. Frollo frames his cruelty and control as necessary to keep Quasimodo safe and leverages his support for Quasimodo that was specifically ordered by a priest as an atonement for police brutality and murder to manipulate the boy's obedience. Hunchback shines where Peacemaker stumbles a bit, showing the connections between Frollo's authoritarianism as a judge and a holder of systemic power, as well as a father, wielding social power over his son. The overreach he perpetuates in his role mirrors the overreach in his social life. He uses manipulation and desperation to manipulate and control Esmeralda due to his fetishization of her and his hatred of her race. He manipulates and indoctrinates Quasimodo and keeps him quietly desperate and terrified in order to keep him obedient, even when Frollo isn't around. Quasi, like the city and people around him, is heavily policed, 
And when manipulation and control cannot get him what he wants, Frollo is always happy to trample over laws, morality, and social conventions people rely on to defend themselves. He's an example of a villain who represents a constant threat of violence that is palpable. Every word he says, no matter how seemingly kind or genuine, is dripping with a barely contained malice and a hint of warning of the violence that backs up everything he says. Hunchback shows us how min Hunchback shows us how minority communities are targeted, how to spot fascist rhetoric, a riot in response to racial policing violence, and the inner dynamics of an abusive family that all tie together thematically and enhance each other. Yet at the same time, it does at times lean on and validate some racist ideas about the people it's also defending. The depiction of the Court of Miracles is nothing less than exactly as the fascists described in the text of the film, at least initially. There are better videos that go further into this, go ask your mother. Jumping to the next topic, the X-Men franchise actually has somewhat similar themes that are more specific to an American context of fascism, and the entire series and its many entries often have pretty thought-provoking and real things to say about the media culture around us, our social culture, oppression, and a lot more. The X-Men franchise has always been very overtly anti-fascist. In 1963 by the late Stan Lee, a known anti-racist activist and World War II veteran, the X-Men were created by Stan's desire to play with the idea of heroes hated by the public they defended, and he openly pulled from the civil rights movement to do that. The greatest manifestation of that idea was the X-Men. Introduced in September of 1963, the X-Men were a team of teenage mutants led by their teacher and mentor, Professor Charles Xavier, who fought super criminals and other mutants led by Magneto, bent on the destruction of humanity. Rather than a black and white battle between good and evil, the X-Men had a wrinkle. Mutants were hated by the normal humans that they defended. I love that idea, Lee told The Guardian in 2000, as the first X-Men movie hit theaters. It not only made them different, but it was a good metaphor for what was happening with the civil rights movement in the country at that time. That metaphor extended to the characters themselves, with Professor X and his vision of harmonious human-mutant coexistence standing in for Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., while Magneto's rigid attitude toward the defense of mutant kind reflected the philosophy of Malcolm X. The Sentinels, a brand of massive mutant hunting robots, were introduced two years later as readers watched on TV as black Americans were beaten and abused by white police officers. As the franchise went on, its focus at times pivoted to being a queer allegory, but the spirit of the franchise always remained. The show Wolverine and the X-Men is probably one of my favorite interpretations of the series. Rewatching it recently is kind of disturbing. The show has a lot to say about over-policing communities, state fascism, police brutality, and most terrifyingly, how Americans' fears are exploited in moral panics by a media environment that exists to manufacture consent for more and more violent policing, and how that policing forces minority communities to defend themselves. In Wolverine and the X-Men, one of the recurring villains is Senator Kelly, a politician who is strongly anti-mutant. One of his main projects is getting the public to support the idea of Sentinels, robot police that detect mutants and eliminate them on the spot. In this world, politicians are literally advocating for kill-on-sight policies for mutants. In that press conference, the Sentinel detects a mutant in the crowd and nearly kills the entire crowd trying to attack her. And in the original animated series, the Sentinels turn on humanity explicitly because they can't actually tell the difference between humans and mutants. They are literally the same. The humans' fear and ignorance make them create the object of their own genocide. And all the while, it's the mutants doing community defense and direct action that really does reflect real life. Think about black and brown Americans sounding the alarm on American fascism back in the 60s, warnings that have since come to fruition and threaten to end us now while being demonized in the media and hated. If you go on social media or look on the news now, you'll find plenty of stories using fear-mongering and outrage porn to get clicks and attention and drive engagement. The buzz around critical race theory is an easy example. Critical race theory in real life is a branch of legal studies. In the right-wing zeitgeist, they have intentionally twisted it to mean anyone learning anything about racism or American history outside of a nationalistic, pro-American lens. The fear and anger drummed up by talking heads and media pundits with agendas led to scores of angry parents, both real and fake, going to school board meetings to scream about kids being indoctrinated to hate America. The manipulation of the definition of critical race theory was not some overt conspiracy. People on the right were blatantly saying that this was the point, to change the actual definition so that anyone discussing racism anywhere could be immediately silenced by accusing them of critical race theory. This same intentional manipulation of thoughts, speech, and definitions was done with queer and trans people, accusing anyone existing in public as a trans or queer person, or discussing their identity 
of grooming kids while systematically finding ways to abuse trans teens. The X-Men series we're discussing was probably written with post 9-11 America in mind and the anti-Muslim fervor that was ignited in people by the events. The fear mongering perpetuated by the media and war profiteers and by the president made our parents and grandparents willing to sign over our freedoms and privacy in ways that we can never come back from. It militarized our police and set us on the path to the violence and surveillance seen during the 2020 uprisings. And all the while, people profited. While the government lied about WMDs, American Muslims faced criminalization and widespread entrapment, a rise in hate crimes, deportations, and violence. And the populace that the media and government instilled virulent patriotism into became increasingly radicalized and atomized in ways they could no longer control. While Muslims in America, Sikhs, and other minority communities faced increasing criminalization and stigma for crimes they had nothing to do with, terrorism has increasingly become the domain of the American far right. There are episodes that are pro-migrant, that discuss prison violence and non-carceral solutions, the merit and inevitability of violence for minority communities. In it, the police are consistently an enemy that the X-Men have to lie to, hide from, fight, and escape from. Magneto as a villain is really interesting because as both a Holocaust survivor and a mutant, he is very militantly anti-racist. And he's one of those villains that have over time become less evil for various reasons. Like Harley Quinn isn't evil anymore because culturally we have a better understanding of the functions of domestic violence and abuse. Poison Ivy culturally became a hero by literally no one's actions, just because, just our own perceptions because it's impossible to say she's wrong in an era of visible environmental collapse. Magneto is less able to be seen as a villain because we live in an era of rising violent fascism, where the need for communities of color and other minorities to assert their right to exist through self-defense and anti-fascist action is extremely visible. Magneto's mutant separatism has always been framed as extreme, but to be honest, is he wrong? I think he's a prime example of an issue Marvel has in general, where sometimes their villains are a bit incomprehensible because they have to work hard to make someone who's basically right morally seem evil enough to be the enemy. It's hard to see him as the villain sometimes when the X-Men are having to violently defend themselves from being wrongfully targeted by police, being forcibly jailed by the government, and forced to be living weapons, and being literal victims of genocide. In Wolverine and the X-Men, it's a stated plot point that the government killed all telepathic mutants at one point, and has forcibly marked the remaining human passing mutants, that's a real term, to be identifiable. X-Men is anti-fascist in the most overt and specific ways that it can be, discussing the very specifically modern ways that fascism spreads and takes advantage. The franchise is constantly weighing the cost of fighting fascism, of engaging in violence. The fact that the story always leans on the misguided revolutionary gone too far trope stales it a bit at times, and it's honestly a really tired trope. Plus, the reformism sometimes creates scenarios where the characters reinforce the systems around them rather than fighting them. It's hard to see the X-Men as such revolutionary figures at times when they're breaking their friends out of an evil fascist mutant super jail where they get tortured one day, then putting other mutants in that same abusive, corrupt, and violent jail to be tortured. There's a core hypocrisy that exists if the X-Men are supposedly against these systems, but also against other mutants who are also against these systems. Especially when you have Wolverine on your team, and that guy can basically only murder. And because of the nature of comics, the story never really ends. The X-Men aren't going to fight a revolution to completion and like actually create a better world. We won't see what that looks like. They're going to fight to reform the systems they live in and try to remain peaceful. The violent futures that are always seen in the X-Men comics and stories never come. They always prevent it, they always go back in time, it always changes. I mean, there are exceptions to this, obviously, but it's like, fucked up country western dystopia. But the answer is always reform. It's always stopping the radicals from going too far and making things worse for the good, law-abiding mutants. They, like all superheroes, fight to preserve the status quo. On top of that, Wolverine and the X-Men specifically have some issues when it comes to its portrayal of Africa and Storm. There are genuinely so many shows and movies on my list to potentially discuss that I have to skip some things other than the thoughts I've already expressed. The primary piece of anti-fascist fiction I would like to discuss is Disney's Andor. Like Peacemaker, it dives into the family dynamics and struggles of reactionaries. Like X-Men, it discusses the actual systems around fascism, as well as the social impacts and uses both written and visual language that evoke real-world systems around us to make its point. So let's talk about it. I am 
proud to announce that before Andor, I was three years sober from my addiction, and now that the show is over, I can quit whenever I want. Joking aside, I saw a lot of hype for this show on Twitter, especially from the gaping nightmare hellscape that we call left Twitter, so even though my tendency is typically to ignore most Disney-related media that comes out these days, I decided to give it a watch, and I genuinely enjoyed it in a way that I haven't enjoyed most things lately. I think out of all the Star Wars media we've seen in the last few decades, Andor might be the most overtly and intelligently anti-fascist, maybe the most Star Wars has ever been. Which isn't to remove merit from the previous entries in the series, the franchise has always been anti-fascist, as said by George Lucas himself. The anti-colonial and anti-fascist themes come up best in the original trilogy, where we see guerrilla soldiers of the rebellion fighting in the forests in overt references to Vietnam, and prequels where a lot of the anti-fascist themes are focused on the personal radicalization and desperation of Anakin by Palpatine, and the political machinations and power grabs being performed by the soon-to-be Emperor. The game Fallen Order also bears some of the same anti-colonial and anti-fascist elements, exploring the downfall of the Republic and the Jedi Order into fascism, and it takes the steps to show aspects of the Empire's colonization of the galaxy through the rebellion on Kashyyyk, where the Empire runs a prison and a refinery that runs on slave labor. In story, the rebels flee the Empire by going deeper into the mountains and jungles of Kashyyyk, where the Empire can't penetrate, evoking the actual movements of revolutionaries during Vietnam and Haitian revolutions. Andor takes some of these elements and blends them, really blurring the line between colonialism and fascism in its analysis of both, in a way that I think adds to our understanding of both. The show centers Cassian Andor, whose birth name on his home planet Canari is Casa, but has been changed to hide his origin. The people he comes from, the language they speak, are dead, killed off by Republic-era imperialism before the Empire was ever even a thing, and Imperial-era mining disasters. This is almost never verbally explained to the audience in full, but is mostly provided through environmental storytelling. Another scene where more anti-colonial lenses are shown is after Andor escapes the Imperial prison on Arkina 5. During a run-in with locals after the escape, they learn how the Empire has been colonizing these people's homes and using it as a prison and how that prison has led to them having water shortages for their crops, and the water being poisoned. During the heist on Aldani, a planet colonized by the Empire, the rebel plant within the Empire, Gorn, has conversations with other Imperials where they degrade the locals as stupid and easily manipulated, say that they stink, and basically behave exactly like racist colonizers, happy to see these people driven off their land and forced to depend on the benevolence of the Empire to continue their most basic rituals, a rite that is stomped on after the heist is completed, at which point the Empire cracks down on the already colonized people. Andor is really interesting to me for two reasons. In it, you see the most deeply and overtly fascistic incarnation of the Empire, and the more detailed and intimate understanding of the actual rebellion. In previous Star Wars media, especially recently, Disney Corporation's obsession with not seeming political stripped Star Wars of its more anti-fascist themes. The Disney Corporation's obsession with not seeming political stripped Star Wars' more anti-fascist themes of their teeth. The sequel trilogy is definitely a prime example of anti-fascist art that is anti-fascist aesthetically, but ideologically blank. The story in those films seemed more interested in, like, self-referential meta-narratives about Rey's right to be the main character of the sequel trilogy, rather than making, like, grand, meaningful statements about the nature of fascism and fighting fascism itself. It gets close occasionally, but I don't think it should be controversial to say that those films lack a bit of substance on this topic. With regards to the Empire and Andor, they're pretty brutal. One character, Nemec, describes the Empire's policy as them intentionally using terror tactics and atrocities as deterrents for rebellious activity. But we get more detail into the intricacies of their brutality. For example, a look into the ISB, basically the Empire's FBI, mostly through the focal lens of Deidre Miro, a supervisor at the Imperial Security Bureau. Through her, we are given a glimpse into a highly competitive environment, much like the actual Nazi party infamously was. The Empire's internal hierarchies are intensely competitive, with people at and above Deidre's level willing to backstab their colleagues or commit atrocities for the chance to move up the chain. And Deidre is no exception. She personally has Bix, one of Cassian Andor's comrades, tortured for information on the rebellion later in the show, and is obsessed with tracking down and rooting out the, the rebellion. She is the epitome of the term girl boss fascism. Another lesser example we see are corpos, basically private policing agencies running on repurposed Republic era gear, who are contracted out by the Empire to provide security to places like Ferrix so the Empire can spare their own resources. Essentially, they're a mercenary outfit providing policing services for the Empire. 
again, another reflection of real life colonialism and fascism. For example, the US relies largely on mercenaries for a lot of its warfare in the Middle East. The incompetence of the Corpo police, the fact that they had Andor in an imperial jail and didn't even know while they were looking for him, and the Empire's reliance on repression, terror, and monetary incentive to keep everything controlled reveal its weakness and disorganization. This is most brought to fruition during the prison break and the riot at the season finale. We see the same fascist cops who have been bullying and torturing our main cast, reduced to crawling on the floor, screaming for their own lives, huddled in closets hiding from justice. It's deeply satisfying. Another detail in the second to last episode after the prison break happens when Andor comes across two natives on Arkina 5. They're mentioned before helping them off planet that the Empire's prison poisoned their water supply and killed the agriculture and wildlife, wildlife that relied on it. Nowhere else in Star Wars does the Empire feel so specifically like an actual fascist colonial empire with incompetent, abusive cops, ruthless secret police, racist and fascistic policies, and a basis in colonialism and exploitation. The systemic realities of the world enrich the behaviors and actions of the characters in them and make them feel much more real and sensible. Conversations with the characters, especially the rebels, sound like conversations that I've had in actual real life with my own comrades, especially when it comes to operational security and informational security. The paranoia of the characters and their struggle to keep certain information secret or to discern who does or doesn't know what and what to do about it are one of the best and most real and intense parts of the show. The character's desperation to stay a step ahead of the Empire, and the Empire's constant status two steps behind them, produce a very potent and organic anxiety and dramatic irony as we watch characters stumble into or out of traps, and the Empire constantly failing to keep up in anything other than their capacity for immense horrific violence. The show is nothing if not a harsh reminder to keep your OPSEC good. In terms of the actual rebellion itself, as stated a moment ago, they feel very real in both good and bad aspects. The Rebellion certainly has its main characters. Luthen, Sinta, Saw Gerrera, Mon, Motha. Mon Mothma are some of the characters I enjoyed seeing the most in whose perspectives we center the most. Sinta and Vel's overtly queer relationship is one of the first four in mainstream Star Wars film and is played very complexly, exploring a dynamic between two people united by a greater purpose that overshadows and overbears on their relationship. I love the conflict that Sinta displays between her duty and her relationship, or rather the lack thereof. She doesn't struggle to keep that divide up, but Vel does, and it's interesting to see the two of them go back and forth in that. I find Saw and Luthen most fascinating. I relate a lot to Saw's distrust and paranoia, and seeing why he developed those traits is entertaining and insightful, and also legitimately sad. Luthen's absolute dominance of the flow of information and security culture of the Rebellion makes him inherently shady, and he's very openly aware of how shady the choices he makes are. The scene where he tells Saw about the ambush on Krieger is so fascinating because Skarsgård really sells Luthen's own quiet desperation and a hope that he has that Saw will intervene or know something that he doesn't or will be able to help in a way that he can't. He legitimately feels guilt for the choice he's making and he's legitimately hoping that there's something someone else can do that he can't. Essentially, Luthen gets word that an ally, one Saw doesn't particularly like, is about to run into an Imperial ambush. Helping him though would expose a spy Luthen has planted within the Empire. The choices he makes eat at him, but he makes them anyway, and the double life he and Mon Mothma lead creates such an intense solidarity between the two of them, especially as Mon Mothma is drawn deeper and deeper into the criminal underworld and the revolution spawning within its guts. Her intention is not to get involved with any of that, but just to provide some kind of support. She isn't even fully aware that acts of terrorism and violence are spawning from the funds that she's providing until later on. Not to be a cop out, but Cassian himself is truly my favorite character. His own silent desperation and rage shows in every scene. Cassian has the vibe of a crab in a bucket scrambling to survive. Already, already a veteran of several scattered, failed, and deadly insurrections, he's given up on actually fighting the Empire and just wants to keep his head down, find his sister, and stay off their radar. Watching him go from this exhausted, jaded former revolutionary turned petty criminal back into a revolutionary when imprisoned and backed against the wall is the best character transformation in the show. That rant aside, in most stories that are about anti-fascism, there's a special group of main characters and heroes who single-handedly defeat the fascist threat in single combat or whatever, but I think this show goes out of its way to depict the fight against fascism as one carried out primarily by normal people making very brave choices every day to occasionally do exceptional things. I think this is probably the most important thing anti-fascist media can do, 
show normal, regular, unspecial, vulnerable ass people choosing to fight anyway. Because that's who fights fascism in real life. There's no Luke, there's no Aang, there's no Harry, there's no special main character, no great men to come from the sky. Just regular people surviving through collective anti-fascist solidarity, mutual aid, and not gang snitching. Seriously, I love that every snitch in the show gets killed. Keep your upset good. But enough of my half-assed analysis. This video gives me a chance to rant about anti-fascist media I like. My opinions on the show itself are less relevant here. Trust me, there are more than enough videos spending hours singing this show's praises. I wasn't actually going to watch Andor, like I said at the beginning of this. I haven't liked Star Wars since The Rise of Skywalker, and I've gotten good at not watching Disney, Marvel, Star Wars stuff. I made the exception for Andor because of the reaction I saw for people on the more radical side of the internet. People were expressing surprise that such a radical anti-fascist show was able to come out of Disney, and they were right to be surprised. Nemec's speech on democracy, for example, reads almost like insurrectionary anarchist theory. The emphasis on radical, decentralized direct action is very familiar, and the speech is very beautiful. Abstracted from its original context in the world of Star Wars, it can stand on its own as a piece of anti-fascist art or philosophy. Along with that, the imagery is nothing short of evocative. The cinematography and writing of the story itself both work to deliberately draw parallels to real-life situations of oppression, most specifically to an American audience. For example, Andor himself being played by Diego Luna, a Mexican, makes the character's status as an indigenous refugee that much more notable to an American audience. Cassian's adopted father, a black man, is basically framed for a crime he didn't commit and literally lynched by the Empire. Again, very deliberate imagery. And the show has several moments where it references British British Empire era where it references British Empire era colonial policies and racism, using real language and repurposing it for fictional situations and races. Having knowledge of real world imperialism and colonial dynamics, fascism and policing is rewarded in this show. They very knowingly pull from certain concepts. You can even argue the empire is an example of Foucault's boomerang. Republic era imperialism, authoritarianism, and colonialism having turned inward toward the republic itself and turning it into a fascist empire. But the presence of radical imagery is not itself radicalism. Time after time, the villain in Hollywood films will turn out to be an evil corporation. Far from undermining capitalist realism, this gestural anti-capitalism actually reinforces it. Take Disney Pixar's WALL-E in 2008. The film shows an earth so despoiled that human beings are no longer capable of inhabiting it. We're left in no doubt that consumer capitalism corporations, rather one mega corporation by and large, is responsible for this depredation. And when we eventually see the human beings in an off-world exile, they are infantile and obese, interacting via screen interfaces, carried around in large motorized chairs, and sipping indeterminate slop from cups. What we have here is a vision of control and communication, as much as John Baudrillard understood it in which subjugation no longer takes the form of a subordination to an extrinsic spectacle, but rather invites us to interact and participate. It seems that the cinema audience is itself the object of this satire, which prompted some right-wing observers to recoil in disgust, condemning Disney Pixar for attacking its own audience. But this kind of irony feeds rather than challenges, capi feeds rather than challenges capitalist realism. A film like WALL-E exemplifies what Robert Fowler has called Interpassivity. The film performs our anti-capitalism for us, allowing us to continue to consume with impunity. The role of capitalist ideology is not to make an explicit case for something in the way that propaganda does, but to conceal the fact that the operations of capital do not depend on any sort of subjectively assumed belief. It is impossible to conceive of fascism or Stalinism without propaganda, but capitalism can proceed perfectly well in some ways better without anyone making a case for it. At this point, I can hear many of you saying it's just a show, it's just Star Wars, you're thinking too hard, let people enjoy things. I want to counter that by saying that one, people are allowed to criticize the thing you like and think more deeply about it, even if you personally do not want them to or do not enjoy that. And two, yes, it's just Star Wars, but that doesn't mean the cultural impact and implications shouldn't be observed just because you don't like the outcome. Art should be examined in its full material context, and in the full material context and or falls short. The radical aspects of the show aren't actually that radical. I mean, obviously they aren't going to name drop capitalism in Star Wars. They'll hint at the monetary incentive behind the empire and at colonialism. But Star Wars ain't about the overthrow of capitalism. It's not really about the overthrow of anything. 
Nemec's speech about democracy sounds very radical and clearly pulls from actual radical theory, but at the end, it's pro-liberal democracy. In universe, the same system that led the galaxy where it is now. And when the empire falls, the same republic basically gets established again and immediately collapses into rebellion against the First Order. At least so far, the story literally cannot explore the idea of a better world post-empire or what that looks like or means. There is only the empire and only the act of rebellion or the slow collapse of democracy. The characters are trapped under fascism not by systems, but by the story itself. As long as the rebellion makes money, then the rebellion is the only story that will be told, no matter how much it devalues the earlier stories told. Ultimately, regardless of the supposed radicalism of the story or its writers, this fundamentally exists to make money for the Disney Corporation. To the writers, maybe the words they put down mean something more, but for the executives, it's just cold cash. The show doesn't exist to radicalize you. It exists to cater to that impulse in a way that commodifies it. If it appeals to you as a radical, it's because it's built to do that, so you spend money on it to see it. Isn't that inherently itself devaluing of the story's message? The audience is already primed to strip real-world meaning from it. At the beginning of this section, I said how some of you are already typing, it's just a show in the comments. You know it's just a Disney Star Wars shill. So you've already in your mind separated the show's radicalism from any sort of action to be taken in real life. Even if the show gives a step-by-step -step instruction on how to start a rebellion, build Molotov cocktails, and throw them at tanks or whatever, it doesn't matter if the audience is already programmed to separate the show's message from real life or actionable ideas. I think on some level, the nature of the environment surrounding the show inherently creates a barrier between the show and real life for the audience. Andor may intentionally evoke real life situations of oppression familiar to an American audience, but ultimately what they're doing is commodifying that experience too. What they've done is make a show that waves our own trauma and core beliefs in our faces as a commodified experience on Disney Plus that you can buy for $12.99 or however much Disney Plus costs now. I pirated it. The ideology pre presented in the show doesn't really matter. It's all just money and Disney has no issue releasing shows and movies with the exact opposite ethos to what's expressed in Andor and using their POC characters to spout deeply fascistic ideology. Falcon and the Winter Soldier is a prime example of this, a show that references real life situations of oppression, just like Andor, but that ultimately doubles down on that exact system. A show whose message to those disaffected by Empire is literally, get over it, things are different now, presented as hopeful and aspirational, even as the same story and narrative shows us repeatedly that things not only have not changed and are not better for the disaffected, but that anyone who is trying to improve them is a murderous terrorist. The show repeatedly shows us situations that prove that things have not improved the way the characters think they have or insist that they have, but then also continues to essentially force characters who want change or who refuse to be satisfied with the current system to either die or get over it. The show is actively gaslighting both its own characters and the audience by lying and saying that things have improved and then also showing us that things haven't. Like, I don't know how to describe the show telling its black characters they have to get over their trauma because things are different than immediately having the characters experience the same racism they were just discussing as anything else but the show gaslighting its own characters. A show that depicts black anarchists as murderers and terrorists and has us rooting for the police to kill them, even as we see those same cops as corrupt, murderous, fascistic figures. The show's ideology is entirely incoherent. It dropped right after the uprising in 2020 in response to police violence and fascism, a largely black anarchic socialist movement. And I don't think the show was made directly in response to that, but it was certainly a spit in the face to that uprising. And Disney and Marvel have a habit of using their black characters to espouse rightist and fascistic ideas and systems, band-aid solutions to systemic problems, and to depict anyone to the left of Barack fucking Obama as a misogynist, terrorist, bomb-throwing demon. I'm not trying to take away anyone's right to enjoy the show, but I do want people to think more deeply about it. But that also isn't enough. We need to do more than just think deeply about anything, if it is to be as relevant as we think it is. What action does this inspire? I'm obviously not recommending anybody raid the Federal Reserve or pull a Harper's Ferry, or do any of the crazy stuff that happens in the show, but there are things to take away that are actionable. The show isn't about how voting beats fascism. In fact, it's explicitly about how, as a series, why that does not work. It's about an active radical community and how they resist together by not snitching, by aiding each other. I think if the show is really to matter in a radical sense, it should inspire that kind of action. 
Right now, our actual real life communities are in fact in danger due to fascism, climate change, authoritarianism, and police violence. There is a collective action that can be taken to stop these things. As anti-queer violence has continued to rise this year, so have community defense organizations such as John Brown Gun Club, local anti-fascist cells, and anonymous and autonomous action in defense of queer spaces and re reproductive rights. Groups like Proud Boys, Oath Keepers, and others only seem to be growing, and the establishment and training up of organizations or collectives that can match them and be able to defend our communities will be essential to preventing the further rise of fascism. There are more than likely houseless folks and struggling families or individuals in your area who are experiencing discrimination from the police and the wider community. Mutual aid and resources for them could make a world of difference. These and other community-based resources combined with community defense initiatives, support for victims of police violence in prisons, can create a base to defend ourselves from these different threats. Right now in Atlanta, community members or environmental activists are fighting for the Atlanta forest with aggressive direct action against the material enemies of the forest, the corporations and police destroying it to build a mock city for cops to train and attack our communities. Right now, tree sitters have been beaten, had anti-riot munitions and tear gas used on, on them, are being slammed with terrorist charges, and have been murdered. They could use donations for things like jail support and bail funds. And if you live in Atlanta or in the surrounding area, physical support in the actual forest. The networks that defend our communities will not simply appear. It is your responsibility. Yes, you, as a member of your community, to find your place where you can help and do it. If it doesn't exist, find some friends and create it. If it does exist, get connected and find out where you can help. At the end of the day, please by all means enjoy and love what you love. But if it has meaning to you for a particular reason, then you need to make that into action or it doesn't matter.